We all? Cool. Leroy Walker. What's up, dude? Not too much. How you doing? Good, man. Thanks for uh, coming on. I was excited to have you on finally since we go way back. Yeah, thanks the, for having me. The day ones. So for people tuning in that um, aren't familiar with you, why don't you kind of tell them a little bit about who you are, like what you've done? Powerlifter. Powerlifting? Yeah. A little bit of ballet. Ballet. <laughs> right. Yeah. I know that you started off what I think kind of kickstarted your fame was your history in the bench press. And yes. Yeah. I started off in uh, competition bench. All, all started back in uh, high school, I think. Mm -hmm. You know, just. Lifting, just love the bench press. I actually like deadlift and uh, squat more. Yeah? But bench bench was shitty. That was horrible. No? Yeah. I'm going to come a little closer to this mic, too. Yeah. Um, Sorry, it, it's, it cuts off sometimes. No, I know that you were, because you're not, you haven't always been in Texas, though, right? No. And so um, you used to bench back in the day with, like, CT and all them, and was it, not Venice, it, but it was in California. Yeah, I started, I started off my career at Venice Beach. I'd say professional career anyways. Uh, they had this thing called the Venice, Venice Beach Liftoff every, like, May. They'd have it. You know, you get all comers. You get professionals, amateurs. And it, was a, it wasn't it was sanctioned. It was a touch and go. It was before. I mean, it was my first It was my first kind of big-time stage. You know, CT really wasn't known to be this. He wasn't the CT is now. He wasn't as known. He was known in, in powerlifting circles. He was known across, you know, Southern California and, and Venice Beach. But it was, he wasn't the prominent figure that he was. So it kind of blew my mind. To look back when I first started and say, oh, my gosh, you know, that guy that was there you mm -hmm. know, with a huge Superman shirt with CT. And so it's kind of look back and it was kind of, you know, those were fun times, fun days. How did you get involved with all them? Um, <clears throat> you know, actually, um, we we weren't really involved. It was it was kind of one of those things where I trained at a I trained at a LA Fitness. I trained at <laughs> LA Fitness at 24. It was a, a box gym. It was a commercial gym, like to the T. And some of the guys I trained with, you know, they kept pushing me to, hey, you should do IG, you should do YouTube. I'm like, nah, I just want to be strong. Because at that time, I didn't understand, you know, trolls. I didn't understand, yeah. you know, the analytics that drove YouTube. And Instagram was fairly new. This is like 2013, 2014. So at the time, I just wanted to be, you know, stronger. And we just happened to catch a lot of it on video. And then when we started to hit you know, the YouTube and stuff like that, then I, we kind of like, oh, CT's, you know, kind of a big deal. But you know, he, he wouldn't, he wouldn't fuck with us. Wouldn't really? fuck with us. He's like, he, I think you told me one time, you know, when you hit a, uh, when you hit a 700 bench, which I was going after at the time, you know, then we might do a collab, which I was like, okay, you know, it was cool because it was motivated. But I think what kind of started all off, you know, believe it or not, is um, I think the, the first kind of feud or, or beef, you know, if that's what the kids are calling it nowadays, mm. was the Hulk smash video. What's that? Uh, Kevin the Hulk Washington. Uh -huh. CT introduced the world to Hulk smash, and uh, it, it, it was a phenomenal video. Got millions and millions of views. But but I'll, I'll say this, from a, from a lifting standpoint, it wasn't phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was 405 paused. So for, for any elite bencher a guy who's you know 600 plus 405 pause reps for five reps is that's a warm-up so i was like cool this is an amazing video but this this is what makes it i'm told i got to do a 700 bench and i'm already a legitimate 600 pound bencher on my way to 700 but but this is what makes the cut so so we we had fun with it you know we kind of made mm -hmm. a couple parodies and then all hell breaks loose Just fast forward to uh the the infamous confrontation at the Olympia. I'm I'm with my entourage. Hulk is with his entourage, and it was like something out of a movie. You know, two Goliaths, two Titans, just headed towards each other, and then CT's right there. And uh, Hulk has his things he want to say. You know, don't ever make this video and blah blah blah. And I was like, I don't give a fuck. Yeah. You know, there's a bench. There was bench presses all around us. I was like, let's go bench over there. And he's like, nah, you know, and, and, and that's kind of what kick started as far as the YouTube. And I found out really quick that YouTube was not a platform I really cared for, mm -hmm. you know, because of all, you know, it, it was covered. It got a lot of publicity, but a lot of, I learned early on from, you know, from a powerlifting standpoint, when you, when you go to an event that's, 
ninety percent bodybuilding dominant, and you're you're what I would or what I would call functionally fluffy. I'm not ripped. I'm not aesthetic. <laughs> I'm functionally fluffy. So the bodybuilding pages and and YouTube's that covered it were like, holy shit, who's this fat ass get into it with the Hulk? And uh, it was it it kind of lit a fire because the onus was on me, and that's the funny thing you know about this this internet day and age. You could be a verified blue check certified legit in the record books lifter, but the aesthetics and what people perceive to be reality is what catches headlines. Hulk looks the part. He looked like he was a 700 pound bencher, but never, never had a legit like 600 pound press on the books. What us professionals would say on the books. Mm -hmm. So for me, I was kind of like, why the fuck do I got to prove something? You know, I'm the one that's lifted. I'm the one that goes to meets. I'm the one that's every other day in the gym pressing this kind of weight. But, but in the eyes of social media, he was the favorite. He was he was the king. He was, you know, king shit. And he was also backed by CT with millions of followers. So it, it just kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, I've proven myself. This guy hasn't. I got something to prove. You know, and, and I was just like, you know, it didn't, it, it, it didn't last a long time. Because I was like, the record books won't lie. It will even all this shit out. One of us is going to go down to history as a great lifter. The other one's going to be you know, a great actor. Mm -hmm. And in, until this day, you know, we're, we're amicable. You know, we have, I, I look at what he does and I applaud it. You know, he's a, he's a great guy. And, you know, in real life, he's a great guy, great family guy, nothing bad to say about him. And, and that was just a point in history where our paths cross and we didn't see eye to eye, but it's all water on the bridge. That was yeah. years ago. Yeah. It's times past. And yeah. so you would actually beat, was it CTs or someone's record? That was kind of what put you on the map uh, as far as the social fame of bench. Yeah, I would say. Um, Wasn't it at Muscle Beach? Yeah, it was Muscle Beach. C CT had the uh, the Muscle Beach record of 650, and I'd you know, done a 655 raw. I think what really, what really caught notice is um, I think when I first – started to win back to back. It was called the American cup at that time. We only really had, you know, WRP wasn't WRP yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, USPA was a prominent, you know, powerlifting federation. And so every year in January there had their, their crowning, you know, event. It was called, you know, the LA fit expo, the American cup, uh, for the most part, it was invitation only. And it was the best of the best. I, I remember my first year you had Brandon Lilly, Dan green, David, the beast Douglas, you had uh, Brandon Allen, you know, all these all these huge big time names that I'd only seen or heard about on social media. So to be on the same stage, I was kind of taken back. And I think I went out and hit like a a six twenty four, which which was a big lift because at that time you only had, you know, um I'm not sure I think I wasn't sure if Spoto hit his seven twenty two, but I know Mendelssohn was on the books as far as all time world record with, you know, seven sixteen. So so that was the first time it really caught people's eye because there was a couple announcers that said, Hey, you know what? This guy's a beast. I, I had no publicity going to that. Nobody knew who the fuck I was. Mm -hmm. So to come in out of nowhere, pretty much off the streets, people only knew me as a gym lifter. They only saw shit on Instagram and they're like, Oh, this guy's not going to be legit. And so when I paused 624 and won the meet, they're like, you know what? If this guy stays healthy, I'll never forget. The commentator said, if this guy stays healthy, mark my words, he will be the next 700. And so that little fire, and in my eyes, I was like, mm, in some weird way, 624 felt closer to 700 than it is six. You know, and I got to 633 yeah. and just kept climbing. So I was like, you know what, just just why not go for it? And that's kind of what started the legacy. No, that's great. I mean, that was how I initially met you was as um, benching. And you always you actually helped me out a lot, too, as far as warming up like properly and like not just doing the, the normal like, you know, a lot of guys will go 135 to, you know, 165 then 185 and then you know uh casually move up but you you would start with like the bar mm -hmm. you know like the plastic uh what was that bend bar the um, uh, it was a bamboo bar yeah bamboo yeah. bar and then you would put like 25s on the sides and you would really go slow working your way up and um that that is something i've i've kept with me throughout all uh as far as benching goes and warming up and then you uh, what was the peak number you had hit? What was your ultimate max on bench? Uh, peak number, I mean, touch and go in the gym was 700. Uh, competition was 675. Um, everybody has their, you know, the the big fish, the one that got away. Mine would have had to have been the American Cup, uh, first time attempted 705. And it was crazy because you always, you always kind of chase numbers. We get, and powerlifters, we get caught up. It's a, it's a numbers game. 
And so you look at the, I was looking at the lay land and, and you look at the record books and, you know, I was there with, uh, you know, 675. And then there's another guy that I was tied with. He, he was ahead of me, a uh, great lifter back in the day. Uh, Jim Williams, the late Jim Williams, one of the first guys to do a shit ton of volume, uh, penitentiary. He was, you know, out of, uh, Pennsylvania state pen, um, just a fucking beast of a man. You know, one of the first guys to go over 650 in competition this was back in the seventies. And then after that, I think there's like, you know, 700. So you have this gap between 675 and 700. And I always kind of thought, why? And once you get there, you understand it. And someone put it to me best, kind of like how, you know, a guy like Tiger Woods, how a lot of golfers will be super, super aggressive. Nobody really wants to go out there and lay up. No one wants to play, you know, just for par. And, and that's kind of what it was. No one, you know, I thought about it. Instead of and looking back on it, um, I, I should have taken, you know, maybe a 680, a 690, just to chip away and be solid, you know, in the all-time record books. Um, but no one ever, you don't think that way. Mm-hmm. Nobody wants to, at, at that time, you know, still to this day, nobody wants to be the 690 guy. No one wants to be the 680, you know, because because regardless of what people think, so do it for yourself, you still worry. You don't worry. You still you still care about what your peers think. You still, you still want to get recognized for a legacy. So it's kind of 675 or 700 because you don't want to be the 785 because all people think is, oh, you didn't get 700, mm-hmm. you know, six. But now looking back on it with my, kind of my bench career, you know, kind of being what it was now that I'm 44 and, you know, a master lifter, I would have gladly taken 690 and then lived to see another day and, you know, attempt 700 later. And the well, funny thing is, is when you look at the, uh, you know, the the chart, you see like 699 and then you see 705. And my dumb ass forgot that if it's an American or world record, you could do what's called chip it. So I could have, I in my mind, I think I could have won 700 and made it. But it only shows... 699 and then the next thing is 700 so i didn't think to myself hey this is an american record you know chip it and just try for 700 you you know you live and you learn at the end of the day i'm happy with where i'm at today's episode is brought to you by regen health and wellness the team at regen health and wellness is devoted to helping patients revitalize repair and renew the optimal blueprint of yourself they provide an individualized and concierge model of healthcare, empowering patients to optimize their health span and overall quality of life. It said no one can escape father time, but almost everyone can make the conscious decision and commit to living better and healthier lives. It begins with a mindset. They offer both in-clinic and telemedicine consultations. So whether you're due for a routine checkup or struggling to hit your health and fitness goals, go online or give them a call to schedule your appointment today. No, that's great. Yeah, it sounds like, was, uh, well, just in general, there's a lot of ego that goes into it. I don't know why someone wouldn't be happy with being 685. I, would, I wouldn't I would be mad about that, um, but that's just me talking. So what do you think, looking back at it now, is there anything you wish you would have changed knowing what you know now versus then as far as training goes? Um, um, you know, and that, that's kind of what my platform is now. And, and I'll talk about this later as I talk about, you know, what I'm doing now in Strict Curl. Mm-hmm. Um, what would I change? What would what would I tell the younger version of myself to do? Um, I think especially it's, I think the message is important in this day and age because so many lifters with the, you know, with platforms like a podcast, social media, you know, TikTok, Instagram, it's, it's easier to put out content and land sponsorship versus I would say five, 10 years ago, you really had to put out great numbers with content. Pete, I don't think, I don't think the brands cared a much, much about what your content was versus they cared about who you were as a person and both the numbers. They wanted to know that your numbers were legit and you could stand you know, and prop up their product and say, use X and you'll, you'll get Z, you know, kind of a cause and effect versus now I think the onus is more, it's, it's easier for the companies because now with technology, cause you can have two lifters and they're both strong. But if, but say for example, like you, you bring that you have a podcast. If you bring the fact there's little things like a, like a third iPhone 13 pro and you can shoot in cinematic mm-hmm. companies look at these things. They're like, not only is he at good numbers, he or she, not only do they put out good content, they're putting out quality content that we don't got to touch up, that we don't got to pay a marketing yep. director to do. So all that stuff is more of a factor now 
than it was when I was up and coming. And the reason I say that is because whether you think it or not, if you look at a lot of different disciplines, I think one of the best examples that I, I would say in conversation, I don't know her personally, but I could say it conversationally, look at, uh, you know, like a, look at some of the fighters. Mm-hmm. Look at Rousey. Oh, yeah. There was a huge shift, and she would even say her training philosophy and her training camp before she was her versus once she kind of got to the top. And and I say this, too, on a smaller scale. <clears throat> once the contracts start coming in, not only do you still got to train, you got to train for – there, there's days you'll go to the gym and you got to make content. You got to hit those 10 to 15 stories post, mm-hmm. you know, um, meet and greets. You got to do all this other stuff. So there's times you might train five times a week. Two of them might be what I call fluffer. They might be just a showcase product. And and anytime you can kind of kill two birds with one stone, you can hit something that's going to both showcase product and you get good training out of it and you're not have to worry about, you know, content. That That's the one thing I would say is because of that factor, I think my training changed. I think in some some ways – it made me not as hungry. I think in other things too, with with sponsorship comes responsibility. And this is the thing a lot of younger lifters don't know or don't understand. I would emphatically tell my younger self, be more systematic in your meets, in your approaches. You know, Ed Cohn said you only get so many, you know, big lifts. And and I think that's true. I think I got caught up in once you take sponsorship money, once you take that airfare, once you put social media out there, you're doing this contest. Once you start showing your training log and people see you're putting up big numbers, um, there, there comes this expectation it, where it happens almost every lifter. You, you train, you train, you train, you take on some bumps and bruises. And there, there was probably more times than not than that halfway through you get hit with this little nagging injury and you're like, as much as you, you could, because then you only train to recover to get back to where you were. So it kind of takes, you know, setting a new record or setting a PR kind of takes it off the books. Now you're training just to keep up appearances and to make that contest. So I would tell the younger me, you know, go pick a meet once you peak. I think I did too many meets back to back to back too many times in, in, a, in a very short span because, you know, I was always on the grind. I always wanted to, you know, do better. And then, and then the other thing too is I was chasing this number. I think a lot of lifters, you, you kind of get this number stuck in your head, and it's chase, 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 do or die. Instead of, you know, pulling out of a contest and then explaining, you know, for health reasons for whatever. Um, I, I think that's the biggest difference between, you know, when you turn pro and when you're on that grind is is just knowing when is enough, knowing it's okay to back out of a meet, knowing it's okay to put your mental health or you know your physical health first. No, I 100% agree. And I've mentioned this in the past where I feel like there's been this huge shift in the fitness industry where it stopped being so much about someone's accomplishments and more about their their Instagram following or, you know, how many YouTube views they get. And I think that that is actually, you know, to bridge on your point too, can be dangerous for a lot of these competitors because they're going to overwork themselves and, and you're going to see this influx of um, injuries happen. And so, uh, I'd agree with that. I'd say, I, you know what, to be honest with you, I'd say yes I'd say yes or no to that point. Because on the flip side of it, you could look at the people who who have the accolades, who who continuously put out great content. And and we, we live in this, it's kind of like this parody where great content and great personality kind of trumps all. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not saying this as a slight to these people, but look at, and, and I mean, it's, just, it's, it's factual. It's not even really opinion. It's matter of factual. Look at, Look at the greats. You know, look at the people who dominate social media. Larry Wills. When when's the last time Larry competed? Yeah. When's the last time Dana, you know, competed? When's the last time Kai? These are all fucking fixtures in our industry. And I'm not knocking them. I, I would fucking trade place with them a heartbeat. You know what? Gain X amount of, you know, clout. Um, have a social media and I'm not saying the social media, I'm talking about I'm talking about being able to make a living at what they love. Yeah. That, I'll say, let me say that and be very emphatic and clear about that. These people love what they do mm-hmm. and they put out great content. I'm not saying they don't want to compete. I'm not saying they don't have the drive, but if you can put out great content and love what you do and make a living at it and help and give back to the fitness community, that's awesome. And I think these people have shown you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have oh, is to. Was that you? Is that your yeah, phone? Sorry about that. <laughs> you don't necessarily have to continuously compete. Because you see so many, and, and there's 
there's some pros that I know from Gold's Gym. I won't, you know, name names, but yeah. they're like, uh, and you, you know, some of them. Mm-hmm. Um, there's people that are like, you know, I can make I can make a living putting out great YouTube, and and pay and make ten times as much and have a much better lifestyle and live a lot longer and healthier versus bust and kill my ass to make it to the Olympia stage and then hope for uh, you know yeah. a top five finish. And then what? You know, yeah. the prize money's not worth it. No. The health, you know, we continuously see is being compromised by what it takes to to compete mm-hmm. at that level. No, I plan on having um, one of the Olympians on and uh, kind of further discussing that. I guess what I meant more was as far as um, I, I'm focused more on accomplishments. That's one of the things I've talked about is uh, I'm more interested in in a person's ability to accomplish some really high feats and you know, I don't care as much about the the content. And I know other people might have pre- different preferences. Some people prefer to like look at really cool stuff, but I'm more interested in less influencers and more educators. And I want people that have actually had accomplishments such as yourself. Like if I wanted to learn how to bench or in this case, curl, I want to learn from the best, not just someone that has millions of followers. And, you know, to kind of um, transition on that point too, Today's episode is brought to you by Avatar Nutrition. It is always a treat to show some love to our sponsor, Avatar Nutrition. Avatar is actually owned by my friend Mark, who is a lifting buddy of mine from the gym. What I didn't realize at the time is that his app has been used by close to 200,000 people, and they've used it to lose over 2.5 million pounds of pure body fat. What's really special about Avatar is that it's a complete service delivered through a super easy-to-use app. See, Avatar is the OG in the macros game and created a process that makes counting macros both fun and simple to stick to long term. You've got unlimited support from their community and experts on staff, and they are in the business of giving their clients results that last. Try it free on the App Store or Google Play Store for two weeks, and if you love it as much as I do, it's just $9.99 a month after that or $97.99 for the annual rate if you want even more of a discount. If you're a coach, trainer or you own any kind of business and want to use avatar to facilitate game-changing nutrition coverage for your people avatar is a program for groups too just contact them through their website to learn more at www.avatarnutrition.com uh now your bench career is kind of uh behind you and you focus more on strict curling which did not take you long and you are the current world record holder for strict curl yes And so how did you get into curling? Like, how did you make the transition from bench press into curling? Because honestly, before you, I didn't even know that was a thing. Yeah. I never heard of competitive strict (laughs) curling. I thought it was just something gym bros do. It is. I mean, you know, you ask the average person, they'll say it's a gym bro thing, you know, or it's not real, but yet everybody does it. To be honest, to answer that question 100%, wrong cut, Um, because I want to fucking live. No. I don't know. I'm just going to come out and say it. How, how many how many forty five year old plus three hundred fifty x bodybuilders powerlifters do you see walking around? Not a lot. Not many. Not in my world. But you read every other day someone fucking killing over and dying. That's mm-hmm. fucking facts. That's reality. That hit me like a ton of fucking bricks when I was like, well, I, I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep up this fucking su- this supplement protocol. And here's the thing, I'll be a hundred percent on candid about this. It, it's it's funny, little league baseball players. You know, like I grew up poor. So you're, you're fighting tooth and nail, you're mowing lawns, you're doing whatever you can to get a fucking glove, to get cleats, or if you had an older brother, you're getting hand-me-downs. But it's funny, the, the, the parallel I'm making is the higher you go up in Little League and travel and all this other shit, and people, people can make money off you, or they can monetize it, or they can you know kind of like pump you up to be the next great, you're getting everything handed to you. Mm-hmm. Same fucking thing in the powerlifting world. Same thing. People won't talk about it. The better you are, the more access to higher grade pharmaceutical shit you get. People say, oh, you want you want this? Can we sponsor this? Can we do this? And I'm like, you know, 10 years ago, I was in a fucking back alley behind Gold's Gym dealing with fucking Pedro getting shit stepped <laughs> on from Mexico. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, whose fucking tub was this made in? Mm-hmm. And now you have people like, hey, this is your, we're, we're going to give you up, John, and we need you to do this and this. I mean, I'm not going to go into the whole ins and outs of it, but it exists. Yeah. So even running pharmaceutical grade shit, these people are still keeling over and dying. And I'm sitting here thinking, what, to be the fucking greatest bench presser on top? No. Is, is, it, is it worth it? And am I saying, am I sitting here saying everybody that's accomplished great feats 
runs that protocol? No, because I know some of the best of the best in the world that don't touch gear, and that's fine. To each their own. I mm-hmm. believe everybody, everybody has or deserves to play in a sandbox. I played in that sandbox. Mm-hmm. I see others around me that played in that sandbox that are no longer playing. So I'm saying I will take my fucking Tonka toys and live to see another day, and I will I will create a different sandbox. So can I still be competitive? Does it still fulfill contra- contractual obligations? Am I still relevant? Yeah, I'm not the greatest bencher. I'm not a powerlifter. It's still a sport. I'm, I'm doing something I love. I'm doing something that's a new challenge, and I'll be the first to say it. Regardless of body size or weight or whatever, arms can only carry so much weight. So I don't need to sit here and lie and tell anybody, to be a great strict curler, you need to pump a shit ton of growth or fucking oh, yeah. testosterone. You could do it almost pretty much entirely drug-free and just train your ass off and be relevant. So because I cherish my life, because it's mine and you only get one, mm-hmm. it's a challenge and it still keeps me relevant and still helps me maintain sponsorship. That's why I made the transition. But first and foremost is because I look at the lay of land and I see too many people passing away. Yeah, no, absolutely. There's been a huge spike in it. Um, I think a lot of people are so uh, impatient to a, to achieve, you know, in their eyes, greatness that they're willing to do anything. And that's a dangerous line to tiptoe with, you know, especially the lack of knowledge in pharmaceuticals, because everyone claims to be a doctor now. Everyone's knowledgeable and things like that. I can't tell you how many people I meet that, you know, run stuff. And I'm like, dude, do you even know what you're taking? Like, you know what you're putting in your body? You know, the long-term effects of this, like you're willing to jeopardize your health for short-term, like, 15 minutes of fame in a sense. Yeah. So no, I, I applaud you on that. And you know, it, um, I, I would hardly say that you were ever like not relevant. In fact, I think your, you know, involvement in this sport has made the sport more exciting and relevant. Cause now I see more and more people every day posting curling, you know, they're curling or they, they go meet up with you to do uh, curling classes over at big techs. And, um, it's really cool to watch. And, and so you had set the world record, um, just recently, right? Like yeah, it was August, August. And what did you curl on that? Uh, two, 250 pounds. I think a hundred and 113, uh, KG. Mm-hmm. And what was the previous record? Uh, 249. Wow. Okay. So you, you, Hey, you got it. So, <laughs> yeah. Um, so with that, is there, how does someone, I know you stand, but how much leeway is there as far as like, do you have to stand totally still or do you get like a little bit of motion? Um, Are they strict with that? Yeah, it's strict. I mean, for the most part, uh, let me, how, how do I break this down? There's a lot of, let me say this first and foremost, you know, there's a lot of controversy around it because it's kind of like, it's kind of like what you see in boxing. People, people recognize one heavyweight. They don't recognize this because federations, they want to oh, combine yeah. Um, so with that being said, there's, you know, there's some federations that make you require to put your head back and keep it. So, so in my federation, the one I lifted in was, uh, you know, Southern powerlifting federation. Um, it was, it was hosted by the, here, let me break this down. It was hosted by the NLPC, which was, you know, a company that adopted other federations rules. So it was SPF. And their guidelines say you don't have to keep your head strict against the wall, but your shoulders have to remain in place the whole time. Your butt or hips have to remain in place the whole time. And, you know, you have to lift with your standard commands like any other curl federation. Um, Where it varies is some curl federations allow two different bars, different grips. So that's kind of where the controversy comes in because you allow people to say, well, you held your bar differently than the the previous record holder, Dennis Plinkoff, to which I would argue, yes, that's true, but – if you look at, and I won't go out into this, but for the most part, the Russians have two different bars. And the newer Russians, the new age Russians, the ones that, you know, some Plankov said, I would like to pass the torch and have you guys break my record. They all go with a closer grip. They all go with a different bar. But yet, when I, as an American, did it, you know, it was, all oh, it wasn't under the same standards. It was a different bar. So it's kind of like if the Russians adopt a new bar and they lift, it's fine, you know, as long as they keep it in-house and Russia passes it to Russia. But the second Americans, because I'll, I'll say it, Americans have been irrelevant in strict curl. A lot of power forts when it comes, when you're going USA versus Russia, you know, the previous bench record was held by the Russians, the strict curl was held by the Russians. And so, you know, they felt a certain kind of way about it. But, you know, there's different federations. Um, 
I lifted within the guidelines of my federations. I can't, nor I don't see why I should, I, I mean, maybe to appease other people, yeah. adhere to standards. Let's say, for example, bench press. You have, you know, you see all the memes. You have the IPF, which allows this contortionist type arch. And your hands can be super wide apart, and you literally see these people bring like three the bar inches. three inches yeah. in their federation accounts. I can't fault the lifter for adhering to the rules of the federation mm-hmm. they lift in. Yeah. So on the flip side, I lifted to the rules and specs of my federation, and it is what it is. But I, I will say this though, I don't. I, I see where people, and I'll say this in all sports. I'll see where. The old timers or people want to keep the integrity of a sport. I agree with that wholeheartedly. However, over time, technology is going to change. There's going to be better bars. Um, I say this all the time. Basketball players don't no longer play in Chuck Taylors. Mm-hmm. You know, football players <laughs> don't play with leather helmets. Technology is going to play a part of the sport, and people have got to learn to adopt. Do we do we diminish Tiger Woods' records because he's hitting with better clubs than Jack Nicklaus did? I mean, you, you can, it's, it's almost like splitting hairs. So my job isn't to necessarily sit here and worry about what my critics say. My job, historically, is to move forward and, and move the sport to a different direction. And know this, you, you look at a lot of powerlifters, you know, I'm sure Eddie's Hall first attempt at 500 kg was not as clean as the one he's famous for. You know, Thor's attempt wasn't as clean. So there's been numerous times when, like, say, for example, good friend of mine, Julius Maddox, the first time mm-hmm. he broke the record, you know, the bar moved a certain kind of way. Everybody had something to say. Nobody gives a shit about that particular lift now because when he went on to do the 6, the 760, the 775. So crazy. It's so crazy and it's I was so there smooth. With you. It's so smooth. So what I would say is that that was my first 250, but it's not my last. No. It's not the last time we're going to. So it's going to get to a point where – that the new record once I raise it is going to be so smooth and so flawless. I'm going to laugh. I'll probably laugh and say, "Fuck, I might have not, you know, felt a certain kind of way about <laughs> yeah. that." But that's yeah. that's my goal, and that's why I continue to strive to set the bar higher and not really worry about the, what the critics are going to say. Because I, I can look back and I can be honest with myself: was it as smooth or as clean as I wanted? No, but it was my first attempt at the world record, and I think you see this in sports where you're always going to have the passing guard. You're always going to have people that are bitter because they did it in their prime versus I'm doing it in my beginning stages. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? The old record holder, Saplankov, has something to say about it because he can't go for for numerous reasons, health mostly. He can't go back and reset that. I mean, he could. And, you know, where in the world anything's possible. But realistically, he's probably not going to go back. Thor you know, Eddie probably felt a certain kind of way because Eddie did his deadlift at the end of his career. So people are always going to feel a certain kind of way when they can't change time and go back and battle it out. That's why you don't really hear the people who are setting records now going head to head with people. They're not so critical. They're just like, okay, you do this. I'm going to do this. You do this. I'm going to do this. Mm-hmm. It's, it's kind of the people who did in their prime and can't go back. Those are the people I think they're more critical. And that's just records across the board. Today's episode is brought to you by CBD Online Express. CBD Online Express is a fresh up-and-coming CBD company that strives to offer the highest quality products at an affordable price to help you in your everyday life. They offer a variety of products such as tinctures, edibles, flour, and even their new recreational line, Oxed Up. They also have plans to introduce water and an energy drink later this year. Go to CBDOnlineExpress.com and get your products today. Yeah, that's always going to happen too. You're always going to have the naysayers or people that uh, just always have, uh, you know, some sort of critique uh, to say, and that's never going to go away. So we saw that with the Super Bowl. Yeah, we saw we saw Deion Sanders, his critique of how they don't play hard enough like they did oh. back in his day with the Pro Bowl. Oh, the Pro Bowl. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, he's not wrong on that. That was sad to watch. No, it, the last yeah. few Pro Bowls have been pretty lame. Uh, it's just like obviously they're just touching and not really trying and. I get it. It's not like a serious game for him, but yeah. um, I understand what he's saying. So, you know, have you or are, are you ever going to go head to head with this guy too? Um, so plank off, that's that's really out of my control. I mean, if, if I, you know, here's what I'll say first and foremost: I, I have respect for Saplinkoff. I have mm-hmm. respect for what Dennis did. Obviously, I watched a lot of his videos to learn, but 
I I can't dictate what he's going to do. I, but it, nor nor am I. Without without going into detail, I know I know a little bit about his health situation. Mm-hmm. So to me, it'd be kind of bush league. It's like if, if you know someone's going through you know some some very strenuous times. It's almost kind of chicken shit to say, yeah. "Hey, Dennis, why don't we go head to head?" Because That's a dickhead move. Realistically, I know yeah. it's not going to happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? Are there who are the other contenders? Uh do you know what? In the United States, it's kind of there, there's a lot of great up and comers. You know, there's uh, Wyatt Lozano, guy out of New York. There's a younger guy, um, Mike, who trains out of you know Texas. And the, mm-hmm. These are all guys that are you know that in that 200 pound. If I had to be honest, I, I think it's going to be a while. Before, if you know, and and when I get caught by another American, um, you know, Larry might enter it. I don't know, you know, um, and then there's a, there's a couple Europeans, you know, that are that are, you know, that, that are close. They're like two thirty, two forty range. Yeah, they're they're moving up the the ranks. So, yeah. when is your next competition? Uh, my next competition is you know March fifth at the Arnold. Oh, cool. Yeah. yeah. I still need to go to that. I've never been. Um, so what would you say, you know, the, did you ever have like a past interest in strict curling prior to getting involved in it? Or was it something that you saw as an opportunity to continue your career in, in powerlifting competitive powerlifting more, more as an, more as an opportunity, more as an opportunity and a challenge, more of a challenge because I saw there are certain fundamental things. I think if you applied um, as far as sets and reps and, and you know time under tension and, and the knowledge I had from how to increase the bench from A to B, you know I felt there was a lot of enough similarities in applying theory. You know, technique is obviously different, strict curl versus bench, but um, but uh, there was this though. I think a lot of people have a misconception to think being great at bench press, you know, lends itself. On the contrary, and and I'll say this because people ask me, you know, when are we going to see more bench? Where are we going to see more bench? I'd say from a physical standpoint, it's too much. It's too much wear and tear on the front delts and CNS. They both are front, you know, dominant uh, movements. So it's too. I think to train at an elite level, you got to pick one. You can't train both at the same. You could, but you're not going to be as as good as you could. You so to me, you got to pick one or the other. Or else you're just going to be kind of mediocre at both. No, that's that's great. Yeah, they. Uh... You know, it's definitely got me interested in in trying to try. I keep meaning to come and do a curl session with you. Um, so, how is the training versus back when you were bench training for bench compared to now? Is it? Do you think you find it more rigorous or is it uh, simpler? Because I, I mean, I see you every day at the gym doing it, and um, it looks pretty brutal. But I know compared to back in your day of benching, I know they're very different training styles. But it's wh- it's to me, I would say a, a couple. It's I don't want to say it's apples and oranges. It's very, for me, because it's a smaller muscle group and you need ample time, you, you can easily abuse and overtrain your biceps. So you have to be more diligent about your recovery process because you can't, here, here's the difference. Bench, you could bench back to back or you could bench two or three times a week. However, if you fundamentally go out there and try to strict curl, and do the same movements, you're going to develop a ridiculously shitty case of tendonitis. So with that, I've learned you have to switch up your grips and your training movements. Maybe preacher, maybe hammer, maybe you know static holds. Any everything, ironically, except strict curl. I, I don't ever go against the wall, and that's the that's the funniest thing, is for me, and and that's the biggest mental challenge. That was the big. That's been the biggest challenge early in the year, especially being a coach, because um, I, I can tell you that story. I got into Go it. Go for it. Uh, fucking, I love him to death. Ghost built yeah. a strict curl platform before I ever competed. And Ghost doesn't build cheap shit. Ghost, oh, Ghost great is stuff. Their, their stuff is like easily like mid to close to 10 grand. I mean, I'd say, I'm not saying that's how much their all their stuff costs, but it's a pretty penny. It's high quality equipment. Yeah. Exactly. So I have this pressure of, you know, I have a bunch of people that wanted to sign up. And, yeah, we want to follow you and learn how to strict curl. Ghost builds out this platform. I haven't even competed yet. I just have some really good IG videos. So yeah. there's part of me that's like, did I believe in my grind? Did I believe in my process? Yes. But I have to be re- grounded in reality, which is like Mike Tyson. 
You know, mm-hmm. everybody wants to get in the ring until you fucking get hit. Yeah. I, I could be the greatest, you know, IG curler of all time, but if it doesn't translate and I don't win on the platform, not only did I fucking look horrible in my sponsor that just created this, you know, I have, I have six or seven people that are trusting me as their captain. Like, hey, are we doing it? I'm like, I'm, you know, it's almost one of those fake it till you make it. I'm like, it's going to work. It's going to work. It's going to work. So there was the biggest sigh of relief when I won my first competition, you know, and I, and I, I was really on par with everything because, because we've all seen this. We've seen some people hit some crazy IG videos and gym lists and they go to competition. It's like, what the fuck happened? Yeah. And then you kind of know a lot of their shit was staged. Mm-hmm. So I didn't want to be that guy. Um, so I was probably the happiest, not only for myself to see all the people I trained to see them win in place and everything. All So, so in my eyes, it was validation to the theories and the thing. It was kind of like, you know, shooting in the dark. Like, fuck, I hope I throw a bunch of shit against the wall and it sticks. Because right now I'm just kind of winging it. Mm-hmm. Because I heard the whole time, you got to train strict. You got to train. I had everybody and their mom became a fucking coach. This is what you got to do. Haven't you seen this person? This person's strict curls. This person's strict curls. This is how they train. You don't train nothing like that. And in my mind, you know, I, I had a lot of little internet, you know, quarrels with people because... I said, if I train like you, I'm training like, not, and this is just my philosophy. If you train like 99% of the people, you're going to get 99% of the common results. Mm-hmm. So I will stick to what I know, win, lose, or draw, and I will train like the 1% to get the top 1% results. And it's paid off. And I still to this day have enough people telling me how to, I'll tell people, you know, I'll, I'll go on my lives. I'm like, Fuck, if I ever need a coach, I know where to go. I'm just going to fucking post a trolling video and let all the critics come and tell me what I'm doing wrong. I love your videos. They're so <laughs> funny. If anyone hasn't seen them yet, go watch them. They're they're some of my favorite. I've been in some of them, too. I uh, um, No, I so what is a typical strict curl like training regiment for you then throughout the week? Like, Do you go every day? Do you take days off? Things um, like that. I, I pretty much, here, here's what it is. Here, here's my biggest secret. I train strict curl every day that ends in Y. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's pretty uh, consistent training <laughs> regimen. <laughs> so, okay. So Mondays, yeah. um, Mondays, Mondays are my heavy day. It mm-hmm. starts. It starts with anything. And this is just a you know philosophy. It starts with Sunday night. Mm-hmm. It starts with visualizing. It starts with you know uh, making a plan because if you don't make a plan, you're going to be plan. You're planning to fail. So I'll I'll write up my plan. I um you know I'll execute my meals, I'll execute my rest time. Everything is planned to et. Monday goes out without a hitch. I'll get there. You know I'll start with band time and attention to warm up. Then I'll move to the bar. Then I'll move to you know some type of static movement, and then I'll get to a compound movement, and then I'll get to some kind of usually overload. Um, nothing really strict. And I'll train for weeks and weeks and weeks. And then at the end, I'll kind of switch it up and I'll get more what I would call platform conscious, you know, because to me, it, it, I, it, regardless of what your discipline is, I always think speed and power and volume will win out. Then it's just a matter of shortening up the volume, increasing the speed, harnessing the power. It's always, it's always going to be easier to teach a cheetah how to turn than it is to teach a fucking elephant how to run fast. <laughs> that's uh no, that's great advice. I mean, but it makes sense. It, it is very logical. And so you, um, do you have a certain routine as far as injury prevention, recovery, things like that? Do you go to any specialized places or do you just, you know, just rest up at home? Um, you know what? I, I will, I would take a, I take a buffer. Mm-hmm. I have like a, a portable buffer that I'll take kind of in between sets. You know, I have a gun and all this other stuff. Um, you know, occasionally I'll go, I'll go to ROI. I'll do, do a little bit of, you know, not a lot. I'll do some deep tissue, but during season, I kind of like to stay tight because I think when I go into for me, when I go into the gym and I'm super tight, it's not, I'm not going to have a good workout. It just means I have to, I have to warm up longer. Mm -hmm. I have to get warm up longer so I don't feel as tight, but I'm tight because it's protecting my muscles. So I see this happen. Even when I was a bench presser, I was always, you know, people thought I was crazy. I was always against cupping and grass and all those other stuff because I would see people do the scraping 
and all this other stuff. And it would kind of, yes, it would open your muscles up, but it would also open you up to great injury if you didn't take enough downtime off. And I was one of those people, I feel like if I take time off from the gym, I'm getting weaker. So from a mental standpoint of my own, you know, kind of hang-ups, it just wasn't for me. And I, and I said, you know what, I'm going to be the same way with strict curl. I'm not going to worry about massages and all this other stuff too much, too free. I kind of want to stay tight. That lets me know if I'm super, super tight, just take longer warming up. And, you know, knock on wood, it's kept me injury. You know, if I had a I fucking, dude, I'd be so rich right now. If I had a dime for every time someone sent me that fucking double bicep tear video, Ugh, you know, it's so the gross. point now, if I want to, if I want to go throw up, you know, a couple thousand <laughs> views, I'll just yeah. put as a caption bicep tear yeah. and I'll get a million people that want to watch that. But if I said, Hey, just hardcore training video, people are like, whatever. Yeah. But the second it's I put that tour, yeah, I put yeah. A, a bicep tear on there. People are like, Oh, fucking let me see this fucker fuck up. Yeah, it's crazy that more people are interested in seeing injury than actually like something cool like, you know, a crazy heavy lift or uh, just an informal video. Um, And, you know, it comes back to what we were talking about as far as, you know, people just, they want to just be entertained. You know, that's what social media is for. So I can't really knock them. Uh, It is. It's entertaining. Like It's it's to the point now where the one thing I'll say that is fun is kind of when you when you get to the top. It's it's so much fun sometimes to just to kind of fucking like, just to kind of give back to give back some lap to break it up, yeah. you know. To every once in a while, I'm not even gonna lie. I'll put out a troll. Video. Like I think you, uh. we were joking about one the other day. I was I was getting ready to do my warm ups, and I had a uh, a fucking tension band. Mm-hmm. And one of my guys at the gym was like, "Hey, why don't you wrap that around and pretend you're doing reps?" <laughs> it was there was no rhyme or reason to the shit, but the shit gets like a million views. It was the biggest click. I was like, and and I'm just sitting here. You know, this is serious band tension work. I'm releasing my scap. I'm just going through this whole scientific WebMD doctoral thesis of why I'm doing this fucking movement. It was just like, I was just bored, and I had a band, and I attached it to a fucking hammer strength uh, row. And I was literally sitting here just like this. Let the, it was like, shake, it looked like Shake Wake 5000. <laughs> and sit here, it, it looks like I'm riding a horse. I was yeah. like, it looks like... If I was a power lifter and I was hooking up with someone on Yellowstone and we were making a video, like here's this power lifter cowboy going through on this hammer strength row machine and it fucking did amazing. But I could have done the same video hardcore with like heavyweight on there, nothing. The second I do some, like, oh, this is a series, some people are like, no, it's not. No, it's not. Like, okay. Uh, it's, yeah, it's so funny. I do challenge anyone because you are local and, you know, I, I encourage people all the time to go and uh, train and get a session in with you, especially I would encourage people that like to troll or leave nasty comments. Like you're very open with that. That's one thing that's always surprised me about you. And this is one of the things I was talking to um, Zach about was uh, how blown away I am at how personable you are when you meet people and how like you don't only just introduce yourself and talk to them, but you invite them to come and train with you. Mm-hmm. And you do that. Uh, it's every Monday, right? You, yeah. You come in. Uh, every, every, every Monday and Saturday. It, you know, it go, it goes back to we all we all have that we all have that fairness. We all have that little kid. Like mm-hmm. to me, I never understood why baseball players or football players really would, you know, especially baseball, they would sign this multi million dollar contract and then they started the season holding out. I was like, You knew what the fuck the contract was when you signed it, so why are you pulling all these antics? And then it really hit me, I think when I was high school. I'll I'll never forget I went to a max muscle to uh to, to go to this autograph session at the time, I, I think all powerlifters, I would say 90% of powerlifters were probably chubby kids who wanted to be strong and mm-hmm. wanted to be a bodybuilder, but we couldn't have the, di- I, I, I list me. I didn't have the discipline. You, yeah. you gave you throw a fucking Twinkie or a hoe in front of me. I was fucking, I was done. <laughs> fucked. I was fucked. <laughs> you know, I'd still go train hard, but there, there goes my diet. So I was like, yeah. uh, I'll, I'll be strong and have a fucking keg instead of six packs. I can live with that. That's yeah. a good trade off. So, <laughs> So while I was trying to be Jim Bro strong and not have the discipline to be a, a you know a bodybuilder, I was still interested in meeting and learning body because back in my back in my day, we had like Flex and Muscle Magazine. We didn't have IG to yeah. see workout sets and reps. <clears throat> so and plus like kind of bigger I think you even had this too. We talked about high school football, like bigger, stronger, faster. So we so yeah. so growing up, we always had these like magazines or these benchmarks of if you lift this, run this, this is how you get a scholarship. So I would read magazines like Doran Yates, 5 by 10 bent over rows, 405. So I knew I wasn't that strong, but I was like, fuck, if I can get to be this strong and do close to what this workout is, you know, maybe I'll get kind of big like that. 
And I went to a Max Muscle, and they had, uh, I'll never forget this, Nasser El Santabi, or so, he was a huge bodybuilder at the time. Mm-hmm. And I wanted to get his autograph and stuff, and he's like, no, you have to buy this this picture. It's twenty dollars, or you have to buy a magazine. And I remember listening to him. He was sitting here arguing, and and ba- this is back in like ninety four, ninety five. And Max Muscle already paid him like five grand for the appearance, and he was like, "You fucks didn't have my chicken ready." I said I needed twelve meals, and I and it just hit me that. So the point I'm making is is with seeing growing up and seeing, you know, people get these superstar contracts, and not want to honor them, and then you go and you meet someone you think. You kind of idolize, and you just like, fuck, you know, this killed my, the whole fan experience. I was like, this guy's kind of douchey. Mm-hmm. I was like, I will never go out of my way to make a kid, a grown-up, anybody who takes time to purchase a workout program, come to the gym, you know, say, hey, can I get a picture? I'll never pull no shit like that. You know, I'll never be too good. Um, and, and I'm not saying I don't understand why certain celebrities or athletes do it. I do. I get it can be draining. It can be, like, bothersome, especially when you're, you know, like a Jay Cutler or someone. On the flip side of that, I admire Jay Cutler because mm-hmm. anybody knows you go to a fitness expo, Jay Cutler will stand in line for fucking hours and talk emphatically to every single person. And I said to myself, that's the kind of professional I want to be. Mm-hmm. And when, I'm, when I someday am a pro, when I have some people buying anything from me, spending their hard-earned money, that's what I want to be. That's the legacy I want to live, leave behind. That's that's just how I want to live my life. No, I I, I love it, and and you've always come through. You know, I know we've done stuff together in the past, and um, I know I could always count on you to give someone that's coming there to meet you a, a great experience, and um, really whatever we're doing. And uh, I yeah, I encourage people to continue to reach out to you for a bench or curl advice. Um, you know, come down to the gym and train. Uh, it's a great gym, and uh, just, you know, keep on doing that. So it's, it is, um, really deep speaking of diets. Do you have like a certain diet regimen or is it just free for all? You know, not do you really, have to really be free. on anything? Um, you know what I, I do, I do, um, I work with Kush. I have a better job at, you know, tracking mm-hmm. Mac. Is it hardcore? Like to get shredded or lean out? It's just, I guess it's just to keep me from being fluffier mm-hmm. and, but really to make, you know, the car, it's more about, you know, a little bit of carb loading, make sure the carbs um, are in sync with when my hardcore workouts are. So it's pretty like my my heavy lifting days, a little bit more carbs. My other days, not as much. And then during the off season, and to me, off seasons when I'm not prepping for a meet. How long is a prep? Uh, me, I try to I try to only go ten to twelve weeks. Okay, yeah, tops. And then you know, like after this, I'm gonna I'm gonna come down. My goal for the next two years is to continuously, you know, do really good at shows, be able to maintain and increase strength but lower body weight, you know, because ultimately back to why I'm doing this. I want to live. I want to be heart healthy. Mm-hmm. You know, I think, I think that's what it's all about. And that's, and that's to me, it lets me be comfortable in my own skin because I always knew there was going to, and if powerlifters say it's not coming, they're fucking lying to themselves. And that's something that blows my mind. Oh, I, I don't understand why I'm depressed. I never saw this day come. What the fuck? You didn't see <laughs> you not being able to maintain a 900 deadlift. You didn't see that day coming. You didn't have an exit strategy. No, dumbass. I don't feel sorry for you. <laughs> so I've always known that that day is going to come. Uh, the day I can't, you know, no longer go after 700. And, and you know, we live in a society where everything's possible and everybody's voice counts and, you know, everybody gets a fuck. No, it, no. Sooner or later, we're all going to die. We're not going to be as strong. The bar is going to be fucking heavy and it's going to crush you. And you got to learn what happens next. What comes next? How do I transition? How do I pivot? And, and as long as I think you have a well thought out plan and you can execute it, then life only gets better because you're not, it's not, it's not what can I no longer do. It's what else can I do? What else can I do better? I, I think it's like you just have to have a, just a very opter, you know, just optimistic approach to what you do instead of this woe is me. Because I, I look at it, I don't want to be the same fucker I was five years ago. Mm-hmm. If, if I'm the same person doing the same shit that I was five years ago, fucking slap me. I'm an oxygen thief. Someone just put a bullet in my head because I'm already dying a slow death anyways. Yeah. You know, the difference is I'm just going to come out and say it. No, no, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, it, it is important for people to have a post-career plan and not, you know, live like 
this shit's just going to last forever. Cause I do, I couldn't agree more. I see this all the time and that comes back to, you know, we, we were talking about with steroid use and, exactly. um, you know, I just see guys that are retired now that their bodies are just broken and yeah. they went so hard, like as if they, that was going to continue on forever. And it's sad to see it, you know, um, and I'm hoping more people as yourself will encourage others to take that into account whenever they are doing a competitive sport. Um, like, do you, so what is your post-career plan? Just, do you have a, like an end date, like, or a, a certain time frame of when you would want to stop competing professionally? Um, you know, it's, I, I have an exit strategy. My exit strategy is, you know, to, to fade into coaching. You know, I'm still mm-hmm. want to, I still bench coach, you know, become more of a strict curl coach than competitor. But I don't want to put – I think it's unfair to myself to put a limit on – because to me it's an ongoing process because I know I can fade away and not have to worry about the supplement part of it. Mm-hmm. But I don't know – I haven't seen any signs that the strength is going to slow down. Because here's here's something I'll say, and I don't think – you know, if I had to fucking pat myself on the back, I don't think people really put this from a perspective. We, we, we live in a society where, it's, where we're so fucking either or. It's either you like Pepsi or you like Coke. You can't like mm-hmm. both. So I constantly get compared to the up and comers or, you know, the Larry's or, you know, the Dennis of the guy who set the record or, you know, I'm like, it's fine. I'm fine with that. But let's keep some in perspective. I'm doing all this. These, these guys, Larry's in his 20s. Mm-hmm. Dennis did it in his 30s when he set the all-time. CT, when he set the American, was in his prime in his 30s. I'm doing all this shit at 44. You know what I mean? And that's why people ask me, well, do you, hey, you know, do you leave sleep over this? Do you worry about this? Or, you know, what do you think about it? I'm like, I fucking, I'm the biggest cheerleader for a guy like Larry because I get I get that all the time. Mm-hmm. Hey, what if he jumps in the girl? Great. That's a hilarious and, dude. No, Larry, Larry's a fucking, he's a stud. He's a great guy. But but here's here's where I'm going with this. And I'll tell people, even, even back in my bench days, because, you know, record, whether people want to admit or not, the numbers are the numbers. My bench has always been better than his. Mm-hmm. And, and I'm not trying to turn this into a me versus Larry, but people do bring up, you know, points of reference or you're great, but you're not so-and-so. So I'm like, if you got to name the world's number one fucking celebrity lifter or your idol mm-hmm. to make me look like number two or three, I'm still in your top five. I'm still yeah. winning. Numbers don't lie. Yeah. I mean, if you have to bring up this guy to make me look shitty, you have to bring up one of the best in the world – one of the most recognized people in the world, I'm still winning. Yeah. Because that means if you're comparing us, I'm, I'm in your top five. When do you want to fucking admit it or not? I just made your top five lift because you had to name A, B, and C. Like, I got this with Eddie Hall. Eddie Hall is the best presser of all time. If Eddie Hall wanted to be, you know, do incline, he would have smashed your 675 incline. That's great. We're talking about, what, 5.5 fucking million follower Eddie Hall, world-renowned, Five times strong, man. That's who you have to pick to beat me. We're, we're going in the fucking Coliseum, David and Goliath. <laughs> and this is the yeah. guy that you're, okay, champion him. Yes. I'll take my, I'll take those chances. I'll take those odds. I mean, that's not a bad person to like be pushed up and compared against. Exactly. You know, I would rather be compared against the best instead of, you know, just like a local, like someone at my gym. Yeah. Is. So they, um, this Eddie doesn't compete anymore, does he? No, I mean Eddie. He's he's still relevant. You know, yeah. he's oh, still a for fixture, sure. He's you know he's I mean? fantastic. It, it's I the just Tom Brady effect. You know yeah. what? Tom Brady was what 199th pick. Yeah. So there was 198 people that you could have said emphatically should have done better than Tom Brady. What was it? Six QBs before him. Yeah. yeah I think no. I think it was six. There's like they did a whole documentary like six QBs before Brady, and uh, none of them were even close uh, to being at the level he was playing at. So. No, I mean, I'll, you know, you can take it all day. And so with curling as well, you, you know, um, I know we've talked about steroids and diet, but do you take any, like, um, supplements as well to help kind of supplement your I uh, think your regiment? Water. Just I think water. No, seriously. Just hydrated? <laughs> Hydration is yeah. the, Believe it or not, it's so, you know where most terrors come from? Lack of hydration. Mm-hmm. So drink a shit ton of water. Um, no, there's, there's a, I mean, L, you know, Argentine, glutathione, mm-hmm. glutamine, all that stuff is important. Just basic you know? vitamins. Just basic sense. vitamins. Yeah. No, I hear that. Yeah. I, you know, I, I do meet a lot of people that are very dependent on supplements. And back when we met, I was working at the supplement store and I used to get that all the time. And I would meet people that would come from our gym that would, yeah. 
you know, oh, I saw Leroy doing this. Like, what what can I take to help me? And I'm like, dude, you need to understand. They're called supplements, not substitutes. You know, they're meant yeah. to supplement your progress. Yeah. You still got to put the work in. And, um, you know, how much do you think genetics really plays into a role when it comes into what you do professionally? Um, you know what? I hear that argument all the time. I hear time. it all the time. That's what I, I want to ask. I don't buy into it. Me either. I don't buy into it. Why? Because cause if, if you were to say you go to Big Techs and you were to look at most of the guys that are and then <clears throat> you look at their dads. Their dads weren't like like here's here's a great example. Mike O'Hearn. And you look mm-hmm. at his son Titan. There are very few Michael Hearns with a son like Titan. Now is Titan gonna be a fucking beast when he grows up? You bet your ass, but look at his fucking parents. Yeah. He's got Mona and he's got <laughs> fucking The Titan. <laughs> the Titan. Yeah. But aside from that, my dad wasn't a powerlifter. My dad wasn't my dad was like five nine, hundred and seventy five pounds fucking wet. Yeah. You know, so I I hope I'm, you know, way bigger and way better than my dad, but it's but genetically I mean, there there's like for some people, yes, but it's what you make it, you know what I mean? I think I think who I don't think there's a great person out there that ever had someone say, "You know what? Genetically you're not gifted, so you're not going to be shit, so just give up now." I yeah. don't think anybody ever thinks that way. No, I and I completely agree. I think that it's just uh, another excuse uh, to j- kind of justify if they are running stuff. Yeah, but I, I think the people who put too much emphasis on supplements haven't put in enough work. Mm-hmm. Because because when you even when you run subs and you put in the work, you understand how much more work it takes. And so when I get those kind of questions, I just kind of like I mean, <clears throat> if it's if it's serious, I I'll, I'll say this. I always try to deter people. I always say try to maximize your natural potential before you go that route. And that especially for the most part that's why I don't take on kids. I don't yeah. take on I don't take on, you know, high school. I don't really don't take on high school clients because I don't want there to be this assumption because of what I do is what I teach. Yeah. You know, first and foremost cuz I think you have to remain you have to, you know, keep a certain amount of integrity to the younger generations. But then when I get the guys, you know, my age or your age that are sitting here trolling or fishing for stuff, I'll just fuck with them back. Yeah. Like you know, what do you think about this? I'll say, you know, that F500. What's the F500? Those fucking Flintstone 500 tabs, bro. <laughs> <laughs> <I don't Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, those work. Let's take those as kids. No, I, 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 you know, we could not be more on the same page because I, it's a big fear I have of mine, especially as I get older. Um, and I can, I look at where I was when I was 18, 19 you know, and I was so desperate to be big. And, um, what I didn't know at the time was a lot of my friends were running like trend. And I mean, at 19 and looking at it now, I'm like, that's crazy. And I'm really concerned about, uh, as, especially as how much social media tends to, and continues to influence people, especially in the fitness industry, that you're going to see this growth in kids taking stuff that they really shouldn't be taking, you know, such as any type of steroid. And, um, that's one thing that uh, I'm really worried about moving forward in the fitness world as far as um, influencing goes is, and I couldn't say, you know, I say it all the time where we need less influencers and more educators because the more that these kids, they want that, they want that fame. They're going to, you know, start taking stuff. And I used to get that all the time. I get kids that would come in the store looking for test boosters. And I'm like, yeah. how old are you? Like 17. I'm like, but you, you just gotta, you gotta, <clears throat> yeah, I think it's going to take some influencers ironically Mm-hmm. Uh, not only just professionals, but some really hardcore influencers to come out and say, you know what? It's cool not to try to so, try, try so mm-hmm. hard. It's cool not to, because there's so much bro science shit out oh, there the worst. that you have to dispel. I'm talking like common knowledge. Like I'm talking locker room type shit because mm-hmm. I, 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 I can ask, you know, I'm assuming most of our audience is probably going to be mad. I'm not trying to be chauvinistic but let's just say we're in a locker room right now Mm -hmm. and you're talking to 10 year football so you could be in any locker room across any college locker room right now i'm willing to guess you could you could do a poll and you'll have your bro science lifter football brothers that will say yeah last night i went out with sally we hooked up but fuck no i didn't kiss her hold on let me get this straight You'll fucking hook up with a broad <laughs> and you won't kiss her because you're worried about whatever fucking disease, but yeah. you'll hook up with some shit from Mexico and just stick it in your body and not know fucking shit about it. Yeah. Let, let me say that one more time. Yeah. There are grown ass men that will randomly hook up with strange women. They have fucking, they don't even know their last name and have a one night stand and risk their health 
but they won't kiss. But then they'll go to Pedro from Gold's Gym and buy a couple <laughs> vials of fucking Tren, yeah. not knowing where it came from, and inject it into their body. You won't let Sally stick her tongue in you, but you'll stick the <laughs> shit from me. That fucking blows my mind, yeah. and it's the fucking truth. Because yeah. if you were to pull 10 of those guys in the locker room, there will be a couple that say, hell no, I'm not kissing that broad. Nope, not no. going to happen. No, so yeah, so yeah. That, that's, that's the kind of fucking backwards-ass thinking that we need to overcome. It's socially acceptable to, and I'm not even trying to get on that platform, but it's, this is socially acceptable, and that's normal, mm-hmm. but this is, it doesn't fucking seem strange to you. Yeah. That blows my mind. Yeah, and it's, I think it's really just about encouraging these influencers and these athletes um, and people that a lot of these younger guys idolize to be honest, but also be informative, you know, have sources, have uh, an ad- an actual educated um background in a deposition whenever putting out this information and that's one of the things though too is it does fall back on the listener you know um i was talking to tim kennedy about that on the last uh episode where at some point it does become uh you do have to hold the listener accountable or the person doing that to where they need to not just jump on the first trend and that's something i've seen a a big spike in the supplement industry as well Mm -hmm. is a lot of it's just the same or it's these proprietary blends and nobody knows what they're taking but they're just they see an influencer or uh the label just looks really attractive to them and and they're they jump on that and um i would love to see this uh, a spike in more people actually getting educated and learning and i meet some of the greatest trainers around here uh, for example, like Tyler Fluitt is a great trainer, but yeah. he's always learning. He's constantly learning. He's putting out informal stuff with um, sources, and that's stuff I love to see. That's why I'm always trying to send people his way when they ask me. And, um, you know, I think that the brands also have a responsibility as well. So, yeah, I think it, I think <clears throat> the I think the biggest thing though is is I think innately people want to kind of have this this out. People kind of want to have this like. We had kind of have we live in this kind of like scapegoat society where as long as you have an out or a finger to point or someone to blame, you know, oh, I was mm-hmm. misled, I was this and that because people don't take the time to research common sense shit anymore. Mm-hmm. You know how many you know how many times I put up like just for, say for example a video like like you could put out this podcast and say we are talking about X Y and Z and you could spell it out. Like on a fifth grade le- reading level, so everybody could read and comprehend, and you'll still have people that will just not even want to read a caption. Hey, what's it about? You know, they don't want to make up their own mind. They don't want to read. They don't want to do research. I can write a doctoral thesis on why I did this particular movement, uh, you know, or something like. Say, here's a great one. I'll do. You, you've done this with me. Where we've mm-hmm. done like two twenty five partials. Yeah, and I'll have some fucking person every single time zero rips done. Well, did you read the fucking five paragraph long yeah. caption of why I wrote this is what I'm doing? No, yeah. you didn't. And and I'll and I'll even com- I'll be snarky when I comment back. You know, it saddens me how reading comprehension is not one of your strong suits. You should definitely stay in yeah. school. Yep. Do not pursue powerlifting. <laughs> stay in school because reading comprehension is not your thing. You suck. Yep. Yeah. Learn to read first before you lift. Um. Uh. So one of the things we talked about uh um previously that I wanted to expand on. Uh, cause I, I'm willing to bet, especially someone with a credible history, such as yours in bench, you could probably answer this is what is your opinion or really, I, I don't understand it on the arch bench. You know, you're talking about the lifters that do the big, like, you know, arch back. I don't understand it. I, from where I was learning how to lift, I was always a no, it was a big no, no, you don't arch when you bench, but I see it so common in powerlifting, uh, especially among women. So I was hoping like, what is the benefit of that? Or what is, you know, why is that allowed? Or is that even a, a true lift in your opinion? I mean, it's a true lift. You know, this goes back to what I said about the, you really got to hold, you can't hold, you, you can't fault the lifter for adhering to the guidelines and rules mm-hmm. and what's allowed in their federation. They have to arch in those federations? No, they don't have to, but it's allowed. And and here's where I think it comes from. I think it comes from this kind of – it's kind of like one of those 
you know, remember in the Bible, so and so begat, so and so begat. You have all these coaches that started off that really didn't understand how to increase the bench press. Because for the most part, you look at most powerlifting, you go to most powerlifting gyms, most powerlifting coaches, you'll hear uh, numerous times, oh, don't worry about your bench. You have a good deadlift. Don't worry about that. We'll make it up. We'll make up your total. Because they only care about the total. They don't care about really increasing the bench. So it kind of it becomes one of those lifts that fall to the wayside. However, with with my my thought in general is if I, when I coach people, I, I predominantly want most people to use the strongest part of their bench press, which would be the triceps. I, you look historically, most great bench pressers are tricep dominant. Um, and what happens when you have the arch, it, it does shorten the distance. It kind of levels the playing field if you have someone who's not tricep dominant. Most people don't become tricep dominant because of a lack of training to make them tricep dominant. So what I'm getting at is most coaches don't know how to coach it. So therefore they look for hacks to put a band aid on something that could get better, but they don't have time and they don't want to focus on it because they don't understand it. So much of what coaches don't coach just comes from lack of comprehension. And if you don't comprehend it, you end up fearing it. So it doesn't become a, part of what you indoctrinate when you teach people, mm -hmm. you know? And I've seen this because I'll talk to other coaches and when we get to talk in the bench press, they're like, oh, I never thought about this. I never thought about that. So it to me, it makes sense why they coach a method that doesn't force them to make lifters be more accountable to being tricep dominant. No, I and I, I, I totally agree. I do think um, a lot of coaches now uh, just kind of just go for the the – the record, you know, uh, I call it the high school coaching, Yeah. Uh, lack of proper form, more of just trying to get the big numbers. Uh, I just, I never understood that. I do see, uh, I've seen a lot of people on like blogs and stuff argue about, you know, how that's the proper way or how they get away with it. Um, and it, it's, it really comes down to emphasis too. Yeah. <clears throat> you look at, and, I, and I'm not trying to like make this a pissing contest between yeah. federations, but you look at traditionally, you know, the IPF, you know, and um, USA powerlifting to them, it's more, they, they fundamentally, and this is, this is me. I'm going to, I'll some disclaimer. Yeah. This is a hundred percent. My opinion. I'm, I'm talking as a fan of the sport. I think that federation puts too much credibility. Um, there, there's one of those things like, you know, those, those who can't coach, you know, it's almost like that. Those, those who can't lift super fucking hardcore heavy, they, they're always the ones that are going to make the Wilkes argument. You'll hear that argument made time and time again in that particular federation, those two particular federations, mm -hmm. um, because it lends and it gives it a more of an equal playing field to lighter lifters. So therefore, those federations put so much emphasis on Wilkes, it almost it almost gives you a competitive advantage to defy to defy being a traditional you know, on the bench, back, muscle, you know, just be tricep dominant too. If you if you could be <clears throat> a, a 95-pound, you know, woman and mm -hmm. put up like a 200-pound bench because you're only moving to two inches, that makes your fucking Wilk score ridiculously high, and it puts you in the running for a world title. So mm -hmm. the, the fact that they put so much emphasis on Wilkes and those world titles – I think it lends way for that to continuously become the norm versus you look at like the WRP, you look at USPA, they have the Kern, they have um, boss of bosses. They have these huge fucking big time cash money meets. So to them, it's, it's about being the best at that meet. It's not about this world ranking or this. You don't see yeah. you don't see talk of Team USA and IPF or I mean as for or USPA. You don't hear it in WRP. You just hear big meet, cash prize, best of the best. So there's not this huge emphasis really on on having these crazy body weight to lifts ratios like the other federations, and that's why they put because they don't really have these huge cash money meets where the biggest, baddest lift takes all. Those federations are predicated around the best Wilkes. He knows what wins championships. So once again, you can't fault the lifter for doing what they need to do to be recognized and get accolades in that federation. So when the lifter's chasing it, the coach has got to appease the lifter and the lifter has got to appease the coach. So it just becomes a symbiotic relationship of 
what works for them and their body type just keeps getting perpetuated versus you really can't worry about that type. You just have to be strong as shit and just be a tricep dominant person in the other federations. And that's why I think you see the two different lifting styles. No, that's no, that's okay. great. I've always been curious. I know a lot of people, um, it's, it's a pretty common, there, there's heavy other debate. technical aspects. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to assume that your, your, your lifting audience is educated. So a small point of detail where I can see where that, where that competitive advantage makes place because say, for example, you look at the top bench pressers in the world and you look at the rules of their federation. Um, you look at the WRP and look at USPA, you, you, your back, your hips have to be in contact, you know, and you have press commands, your head can come up, which is indicative of a, a stronger press. You can come up on the balls of your feet, which makes for low more leg drive and a stronger press. IPF Federation says your head has to stay. It's a it's a stricter, it's it's a much stricter lift. Therefore, I see why they seek that short and distance competitive advantage because they can't drive, they can't really get leg drive. They can't lift their head. If you lift heavy weight, your head is gonna come up. Now, does that age you a lot? Yeah, it's gonna make the difference between, you know this federation, that federation. So, so when it comes to me and my expertise in the bench press, I think the IPF, it gives way to those quirky nuances because they're so overly fucking strict about trivial shit. You know what I mean? Is, is Julius not the strongest presser, you know, with, with a 780 pound bench press because his, his head raised while he was pressing it up yeah. or his leg drive caught him on the balls of his feet. You know what I mean? Does that make someone in the IPF better because they did 600 or a 600 pound bench press with their feet flat and no leg drive? It, it might pound for pound, you know, to ease their own. But I think at the end of the day, people gravitate towards the WRP and the USAP meets because they want to see the biggest, baddest lift total. Because to the average person, if you have to explain like to me, I'm, it's, I'm even guilty of it because if, if you have to spend five minutes explaining what the fuck stroke curl is, the average person is going to be like, mm, I'll pass. Let me go watch NFL. And I get that. Mm-hmm. So when I have to spend five minutes explaining what the arch is, why they do it, it doesn't make sense. Versus you go to this other federation, they just see people lay down, bench press, and put up a shit ton of weight. That makes sense. It's more spectator viewer friendly. No, and, and that totally makes sense. And so... Now, with transitioning from bench to curl, what? Because I have a, I'm pretty confident that the the strict curl trend is going to continue to grow. You're going to see a lot more and more competitors get into it, or even uh, add it into their uh, lifting regiment. A lot of these powerlifting meets, it's usually just bench, deadlift, and squat. And I think you're going to see a a nice growth in uh, curl competitors. So, if someone is just beginning, what would probably be the best advice for a beginner getting into curl? Uh, <clears throat> don't don't be don't be so self critical of form. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're, pay more attention to to uh, time and attention workouts and to overload. You know, cheat curls. Even you know, I, I put up a meme you know a couple of days ago where Arnold told that you know the arms of the people who do cheat curls are always why is it they're always bigger than the arms on the form police? And, mm-hmm. and it's true because in bodybuilding and in powerlifting, there's so many movements that if you don't adhere to being super, super strict, you're allowed to do more weight. Now, am I saying go out there and, and break your back and have this crazy? No, but I think a little bit of movement, a little bit of English, you know, we even learned that from guys like Doreen Yates and other people, you know, that it's, it's going to be beneficial to a higher total. So my, my focus is, is cheat curl, get as strong as you can, and then kind of work backwards and learn how to be strict. You know, and then the biggest naysayers are the people that will constantly say, like, well, you know, Ronnie Coleman lifted a shit ton of weight and he did a lot of power building. I'm like, well, yeah, he had a different condition that made him the way he was, but it wasn't necessarily because of he trained because there's plenty of people who train hardcore and use body English or movement or or cheat movements and got super, super strong, super, super fast. Um, You know, and it's kind of each their own, but it's like the people who are going to make those counter arguments they're never going to they're never going to buy into what's going to make you great anyways because there's some people that their argument is going to be anti whatever doesn't let them stay complacent the same safe and you know they don't ever you know heaven forbid they you know, get a fucking run in their pantyhose you know yeah. heaven forbid they have to go out there and fucking do something 
Yeah. No, uh, no, that makes sense. I, um, I do see a, um, a nice boost in people starting to join your curling classes on, uh, was yeah. it Mondays and Saturdays? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's, I thought that was a, a pretty important question to ask. So outside of the Arnold, do you have any more of events that you're either involved <coughs> in or you're competing in? We have, you know, big Texas is going to host a couple of things. I really, you know, I really just want to go out there and th this is the first time Strip Curl has been on a huge platform, a huge stage. We're sharing the Rogue stage, prime time. It's going to be like four on a Saturday. So th there, there's a lot of time, effort, and you know, thought and stuff being given to this to this event to make this sport you know big again. And so hopefully th this is ground zero. And 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 I honestly think you know the sky's the limit. Who knows what's going to come after this. You know, I've been approached by, you know, people from overseas mm -hmm. to come train in Dubai. You know, there's people that it, there's a chance there there was talk of, of not doing a certain competition and just doing a one off head to head against Larry. That that has been talked about. Um, it's not going to obviously it's not going to come to fruition because we're four weeks out from the Arnold. But yeah. but I think it sets up the conversation because till I can't I can neither confirm nor deny Larry's going to go jump on the platform, you mm -hmm. know, the strict girl. If he does, great. If he doesn't, I think it sets up talks or it sets up, you know, um, a future where there might be a contest or something like that. Because cause I, let's make no mistake about it. Larry's infatuated with arm wrestling. He's he's helping that sport become more known to the common person. I'm not saying he's innovative because he'll even tell you he's got so much to learn in the arm wrestling game. I've dabbled in arm wrestling. It's a tremendous sport. I take, I tip my hat to the people doing it. But the one thing you will find, and the reason that keeps coming up, is because historically the best arm wrestlers have also been strict curlers. Mm -hmm. And most of the best strict curlers have went on to be world-class arm wrestlers. So uh, kind of back into a point, you know, you I didn't really, you know, get into it too much, but I think that's that's obviously – probably the most the, the easiest it's the most predictable choice of mm -hmm. after strict curl going to arm wrestling it's one of those things i think i think i can be great at it but it's it's a totally different time under tension it's a lot different kind of wear and tear i did it in my off season you know i did his off season prep for the arnold but it, it's tremendous wear and tear on the ten for me because i'm yeah. so new to it you know you talk to some of these guys like the michael todds the dennis larrett's the people who have been doing it forever. I mean, they've been doing it so long. That's why their ligaments are and their tendons are what they are. Because they, So for me, being a newbie to it, I have time under tension. I have arm strength. But there's a couple other aspects that you have to develop, like, you know, pronation, grip strength, wrist strength. So the, the strength I have in strut curl can translate to the arm wrestling table. Do I think it will happen? Yes. Um, at a world championship level, it's going to take longer. It's going to take longer to be good at that than I think strict curl because there's so much technique involved. Yeah, you know? yeah. I watched that documentary with um, about John. How do you say his last name? Brzezin Brzezinic? Yeah. Um, that was a great documentary. I can't remember what it's called, but um, they do go over the techniques. Like it's all about really risk control. A lot yeah. of people think it's just overall power. Oops. No, it, and, it's a tremendous amount of risk control. And and the thing those last guys have is is you only get better with matches. So that is yeah. going to be the biggest. I think check against me is I, I'd be coming into it. Like, do you know, but Larry did this. Larry's making great headway. So who knows, yeah. you know, cause Larry went from zero to where he is now in, in less than, you know, in about a year. So, I, but I'm, I'm kind of more of, I want to, I want to master. I want to make my legacy. I'm not going to kind of go back and forth and do both. You know, when I, when I leave strict curl, I'm going to kind of leave strict curl. And if I go to arm wrestling, I'm going to put a hundred percent into it. Just like I did bench. I've always kind of been more of a, a one a folk, I'd rather focus on one thing than try to dabble in a couple of things and be half ass. Yeah. No, that's great. That's a great approach to things. You know, it's uh, I do see that a lot of people they 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 do one foot in, you know in the puddle and then they wonder why they're not getting you know any results. So so that's a great approach to it. Uh, I would love to see you in arm wrestling. I think it'd be fun. And or you know you could do the the one other growing sport which is the what is it the slap boxing. The slap oh I got. yeah. I think you would crush it at that. I think slap boxing, and, and I've had, I've had, you know, I've got some interest from that. That that came from, um, I felt, believe it or not, I was born. That came from a troll video. Really? Yeah, came from a troll yeah. video. Someone's like, "Hey, can you smash a fucking watermelon?" I remember when you did that. Yeah, I was there. So it was crazy. Yeah, that was fun. It was crazy. It's one of those things you don't realize. There's some shit. I'll say this though. There, there's some shit I do. I don't realize like 
you know what? That's kind of fucking hard until you see <laughs> other people. So I have a knack. I have a knack. Like you've done, you've been there. You've come mm-hmm. to the gym. I'm like, hey, Josh, why don't you come try this? And you're like, I don't know. I don't want to tear anything. <laughs> no, you'll be safe. Go ahead and try it. And then you do. And then I realize, okay, you know what? It's not just me. That's fucking hard. Yeah. You know? And one of the things I think, I took some uh, some walnuts to a friend. And I was just like, yeah, it seemed hard. And then I did it. I was like, okay, that was fucking cool. And I see other people. And they can, I'm like, okay, not everybody can crush walnuts yeah. with their hands. Like hand. they crush the apples. Yeah. Yeah. So there, there's some stuff. It, it's one of those things that comes down to there's, there's times I have to be careful because there's things I do that I don't realize. Like, you know what? You're just a fucking anomaly. Yeah. You know, that's not normal. No, and I um I think there are a lot of growing sports that offer people that are moving on from bodybuilding and powerlifting and strongman that gives them an alternative route because stopping competing can be so hard um, oh, and it's it's you know a lot of people that's the only life they know and so it's it's really cool and enjoyable to see these alternative sports that offer people you know in their post careers another something career to get into because I remember being super excited for you getting into strict curl because I, I knew that your bench, you know, you had kind of started losing the momentum in bench yeah. and, and then with Julius coming up um, and just dominating um, the, the record boards like he does. Um, I was really excited to see you not only just get into a new sport, you know, uh, but dominate it. And now you're hold the world record. And uh, I would love to see you go head to head with the, one of the Russians to kind of silence them. Yeah. And, um, no, I'm super excited for you and everything coming up. Um, you know, for people watching, where are like the best ways to find you? Um, I just, I did just start. You know, I'm launching it next week with the uh, the March edition. There's like, there's a Cows and Curves mm-hmm. uh, OnlyFans page that I'm starting. Oh my know? god! <laughs> <laughs> just, I'm, just I'm calf I'm videos. <laughs> Seventy, seventy two weeks out from my bikini prep. Ooh, um, there we go. You know, appearance on stage. <laughs> <laughs> no, people, people can find me at uh, uh on Instagram. You know, mostly Instagram. I do a lot of lives and stuff on Instagram. Uh, L W, the machine mm-hmm. on Instagram. Um, don't really have an active YouTube page, and you can find me doing more. You know, more podcasts on on places like this. Yeah, you know, more pages. I'll have to get uh, connected with Zach, who was our first guest, Zach Bitter. Yeah, yeah, he he's awesome. He lo- he told me too after we did that ROI event that he'd love to have you on. Yeah, his show, and so um. So Instagram, LW the Machine, um, YouTube's not real inactive. Anything else? No, that, that's it right now. Like I said, the, the cows and curves hasn't hit yet. Um, coming to it, coming to still a, getting the content. Still, still, still yeah. getting the content. You know, I'm not. I, I got to find the niche because as much as I like to think I'm everybody's cup of tea, yeah. functionally fluffy is is kind of a niche yeah. on its own. It's a it's a new fad. I've seen growing fad. it. Well, um, I you know kind of wrap things up. I do appreciate you coming on. You know, you have been one of the biggest supporters of mine from day ones before I even started this brand and this page, you know, from all the way, the complete nutrition days of yeah. you, me and Mark Lobliner hanging out there. Um, no, I'm, I'm super grateful. I'm super excited for you. Um, uh, I will do my best to go to the Arnold. Yeah. Um, I would love to see you, uh, compete at that and, uh, we'll definitely run it back. We'll have you back on yeah. as this continues to grow and we got a pretty fun week ahead of us. So, yeah, but, um, I think that, and, and I'm going to, I'm going to hold you to it. Cause I firmly believe this is going to hit, uh, it's, it's going to get to a point where you're going to hit Joe Rogan X numbers. I'm oh, like, God, look, I wish. I'm, I'm not going to fucking, I, I understand you're the shit. <laughs> you're, you're kind of a big deal now, yeah, yeah. but I was here from day one. I don't know if you I know. want what he has right now though. Oh, uh, yeah. You no, know, but it's, it's what we laugh about that. Yeah. Not, not about Joe Rogan, you know, mm-hmm. um, but we laugh about, you, you don't know what you don't know when yeah. you don't know it. And I yeah. know that sounds like some fucking Dr. Phil shit to say. And I know you're trying to wrap this up. No, but no, you're good. Kyle. Yeah. Five years ago, who would have thought? Oh, Kyle it'd be, Wurzel? It'd be fucking impossible to book a photo shoot yeah. with him, and and shout to out see Kyle where Wurzel. he is. Yeah, shout out to Kyle to see where he is now. Yeah, hey, I've I have literally seen it happen. No, we me and Kyle started together. Like yeah. we were all around that same group, and uh, yeah. no, I, I say it all the time. I was super excited to see all my friends come up and everyone that I'm around. Just continue to watch their growth and the fact that we can all work together to help each other. So no, Kyle's been great. He's helping me find, um, and book some of the, the bigger and like big names that he works with. So, yeah. uh, no, I love Kyle to death, but it's uh, awesome. I, I think the message out of that whole thing and to kind of sum this up is, is no matter how, and this is kind of a philosophy I share and you share. Um, and I think that's why we've clicked over the years is, mm-hmm. is never, never forget where you come from. Absolutely. Never forget who was there for you and, and always pay it forward. Always. Yeah. Always trying to help everyone out. And, uh, we'll definitely, uh, keep doing what we do best, which is work together and, 
you know, we'll come up and I think that, uh, that should about wrap it up. So, right. uh, on that note, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll run it back. All right. Thanks Sorry. for having me on. Mm-hmm.